I'd first like to start off by introducing our fabulous panel that we have with us here today. So we have Ellie Miles, a documentary curator from London Transport Museum. We've got Rhiannon Litterick, who is a learning officer at Sir John Stones Museum. We've got Helen Copping, who's an exhibitions and loans coordinator at Bodleian Libraries. And we've got Nico Tayak, who's a collections project manager at Museums and Galleries Edinburgh. And uh, all of us on this panel today, including myself, have had a relatively recent experience of parental uh, or maternity leave. Uh, so to start off with the panel, um, I'd just like to um, ask a question of uh, everyone in the panel to answer, and I might just direct the question somewhat at random. Um, so if everyone could just briefly introduce themselves, their role, and just maybe share one thing about their parental or maternity leave journey, um, for example, how much time you took, or if you shared it with your partner. Um, so Nico, perhaps you'd like to go first. Uh, the first thing, my Wi-Fi is dodgy, so if I turn the video off, it's to try and save anything from going wrong. Uh, so I might just go back. Right, so I, I'm Nick Attack, yeah, I'm Collections um, Project Manager at Edinburgh Museums. Um, I was involved from my usual job is Collections Information Officer. Um, so it's just a, a three, three years on to manage. Nico, would you mind just turning off your video? Because uh, I think some of us are having trouble hearing you. Thank you. Sorry, it's not that we don't want to see you. You can't hear me. Can I turn the camera off? <laughs> yeah, now that's better. Thank you. Uh, I think we might have lost Nico briefly. Um, so I think let's uh, maybe go to Helen. Helen, would you like to just speak very briefly about your uh, parental leave experience? Sure. Um, so yeah, my name is Helen Copping. I'm the Exhibitions and Loans Coordinator for the Bodleian Libraries uh, at the University of Oxford. Um, I had a little boy back in February, very early February this year. Um, I decided to only take nine months of my permitted 12 months um, maternity leave on the basis that I think as for everyone, the final three months of that would have been unpaid and that's not something I think many of us can uh, can afford to do. So I returned to work uh, about five weeks ago now. Um, baby is now just just over nine months old. Um, so uh, I'm quite it's all it's all quite new and uh, raw, perhaps in my mind with the whole return to work thing. Raw is exactly what we want. Thank you, Helen. Um, <laughs> Rhiannon, would you like to go next? Also, hi, I'm Rhiannon. I am Learning Officer at Sir John Stones Museum in Holborn. I'm actually in the building right now, which I've been very excited about. So I had my baby in August 2019 and he was early. I took six months maternity leave, similar to Helen. My mat, cover, my mat pay was full pay for six months, so I decided to come back. But I've had quite the year. I came back in February for five weeks. I worked from home for five weeks. I was furloughed part furloughed and now I'm back so it's been quite the journey I haven't really managed to get settled but it's been it's been interesting yeah that's totally understandable um Ellie would you like to go next uh, hi everyone I'm Ellie I'm one of the documentary curators at London Transport Museum which is a museum which is like um kind of arm's length part of transport for London um, which obviously has a has very strong um, union so it has very good uh, parental leave package which is great so I ended up taking a full year um, I worked uh, my partner took two weeks so it kind of a quite old school arrangement um, well it was a long time ago it was 2017 um, uh, and so yeah I went from working full-time um, and came back working part-time so I suppose I can speak a bit more about that later if that's of interest uh, but yeah that's a bit of background brilliant thanks so much and uh, nico i was wondering could you just briefly introduce yourself and your experience again because i think we had some trouble hearing you before um that's fine i've just switched wi-fi so it should now work brilliant <laughs> So, right, uh, yeah, um, I don't know how much of you heard that I was saying earlier on. Uh, I'm Nico, I'm Connections Project Manager for Edinburgh Museums and Galleries. Um, I've taken shared parental leave for both of my kids now. So the first one was in 2016. So just after, I think about a year after they introduced shared parental leave. And then the second one was in 2018. And for both of them, I took four months off. And it was great. 
Great, thank you. Um, so uh, I've just got a series of questions now and then I will try to take a, a couple from the chat um, if there are any. Um, so maybe I'll start with you first, Helen, because it's I think you're you you're the one who's come back to work the most recently from leave. Um, could you just tell us a little bit about how the transition has been? Um, what are some things that helped you and what are some things that could have made it easier that maybe weren't in place? Um, I think one of the things that's made the past year really unusual for me in terms of maternity leave and return to work as with all things has has been covid um it, it's it's meant that my experience has been completely different to to what i imagined it was going to be and, and all of that um i think covid has made the return to work harder um i think this is my fifth week back at work now um and i've been in the office once in in those five weeks um Potentially what would have made it easier, and I think it's something that people should bear in mind if they're due to be going on parental leave um, in, in the near future, is do use those keeping in touch days that you're entitled to. Um, because everything was so fluid and so changing whilst I was on leave, I didn't, I didn't, we didn't use any, we, my boss and I didn't really know what to use them for. Um, and I think it would have helped the transition back to work if we're just using for some catch ups, um, some chats to see what's been going on. Um, the thing that has helped me the most certainly is having our childcare sorted really quite early on. Um, we actually identified a, a childminder before our son was even born. Um, and that meant that we had the chance to get to know her. Um, we, we knew that the baby was happy with her and that that element certainly made everything much easier. That's really useful advice there. Thank you, Helen. And just in case there's anyone in the audience who's not aware of what a keep in touch day is, uh, it's basically uh, ev everyone who goes on parental leave, whether that be shared parental leave or maternity leave, or I believe adoption leave as well, you get a set of um, keep in touch days. So there are days that you can, you are be paid to be able to go into work to do some training or get some updates, find out what's been going on and it doesn't affect your leave status. Um, I think that's a pretty good explanation, but you can always Google it. Um, Perhaps, uh, Ellie, would, would you like to talk a little bit about how the transition back to work was for you and maybe some things that could have made it easier? Cool. Um, I think I probably should have had some keeping in touch days, but I didn't really understand them and um, was a bit too sleep deprived to really push for them, which was silly. Um, whilst I was on leave, I had I was on a fixed term contract, which technically expired during the period of my leave so I was super uncertain initially about um, what would happen in terms of would there be a return to work even would I be made redundant um, what was going on there so one of the things that I found really helpful was like talking to other new parents that I met um, whilst I was on leave who kind of had a bit more of an um, informed take on their rights and their situation um, and so they pointed me to the ACAS um, website which was really helpful um, that's ACAS, I think, .co.uk. Um, and that kind of lays out, um, lays out your sort of rights and entitlements, which I hadn't really been super clear on. Um, I'd spoken to my union before going on leave, um, which had been quite helpful. Um, I had a really understanding manager by the time that I got back to work, which was really helpful. Um, I had to, uh, yeah, I'd been into the office a couple of times with the baby, which had been a bit chaotic. Um, I'd sort of forgotten um, that um, vomiting isn't uh, usual where I work and so when the baby just kind of spewed milk everywhere the, um, the then collections manager's face was quite a sight and I was just she was like rushing was like, it's fine I've just I've got 16 muslins it's fine um, anyway um, but my manager had 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 a, a child a few a few years before so um, he was um, more tuned in um, so yeah, knowing about my rights, about suitable alternative employment um, was super helpful. My union were, were, were really clear as well. And um, my employer were also really open to having a job share situation and coming back. So that was really helpful. Um, and the other thing I think before I went on leave that made that transition easier was having um, spoken to people who'd been on maternity leave at my organization a few years, like recently. 
Um, so that was really helpful and knowing that I could get in touch and just say, hey, does this sound right? Or ask advice that was kind of specific to where I was working was really helpful. Oh, thank you for putting that link up in the chat, by the way. So yeah, I would say those were the, the sort of main things. Thank you so much, Ellie, for uh, yeah, the ACAS website. It has, has a wealth of information about um, your rights as a parent and, and also as a worker in other areas as well. Um, and I think it's really, you, you mentioned some really important things about having a supportive employer and the value of that, and also speaking to other parents as well and, and asking for advice when you need it is really key. Um, Rhiannon, would you like to talk a little bit about how the transition back to work was for you? So the initial transition when I went back to work in February, I found very hard, as I'm sure a lot of people, I'm sure this will resonate with a lot of people, I work in a role that has more responsibilities than I could ever have time. And I had accrued so much overtime, for instance, that I didn't work in January 2019. I had so much overtime and I'm part time three and a half days a week that I took an entire month off. So when I went back to work and realised that I physically could not do my job having to leave at 5.30 for the for childcare, I had to think really carefully about how I was going to go about doing it. And so the same, similar sort of things to Helen and Eddie, I basically treated going back like a military operation. That's just how I am thinking about where do I need to be when, where does baby need to be when. I allocated two nights a week to sorting everything baby related because I found the transition in terms of taking my mum, the mum hat never leaves you but the work hat can is the analogy that I always use. And so I felt really guilty going back to work. The last mum and baby yoga session we did when the baby was doing settling in with the childminder, he was clinging to me and screaming because I've been at work the day before. And I just thought, I'm going back after six months, have I made a terrible mistake? And then I actually thought, you know what? Working makes me the best mum. Some people suit being a stay at home mum and that's great, but working suits me. And so I sort of, I did some research into different strategies and some things that really helped me were Instagram, following people like Pregnant Then Screwed really helped me thinking about my rights, learning more similar to Ellie. I didn't know a huge amount about it. I'd use my keeping in touch days. My colleagues and my manager have been absolutely amazing. I'm really lucky at the zone at the moment. I think we've got seven or eight of us with under fives. So there are lots of people in the same boat. Um, I had a colleague who'd come back from mat leave as I went on mat leave, and it was really helpful learning from their experience. I also found Anna Mather, who is um, an Instagram and she's written a book. She has all sorts of coping strategies for different parental issues like mum guilt. And I found reading other people's experiences, but having distance from them really helpful to make me think about what I needed to transition back. The rest of this year coming on and off furlough has been really difficult because my childcare got removed, like a lot of people was working without childcare, which was quite the experience, and I'm sure other people will talk about. And it took a while to get back into the groove, but I feel like I'm slowly getting used to it. So yeah, it's, it's been a journey. Thank you so much, Rhiannon, um, and some great tips there, and also some uh, great suggestions of resources as well. And uh, I personally found have found lots of really uh, useful um, resources on Instagram too. So you know, social media is not all just negative; it's a great area for support as well. So thank you for raising that, um, Nico. Uh, I just wondered if you wanted to talk to us about how the transition was back for you, because I, I hope I'm not going out of turn and saying that you know a lot of men still don't take parental yeah. leave for variety of reasons. Um, so what was it like for you coming back from that um, as far as the transition goes? Sure, it was it was, it was odd. Um, the first time uh, I took off um, was, as, as I said, it was only a year after shared parental leave came in and I believe I was the first dad in the council to take shared parental leave. So there was nothing set up at all. I mean, in terms of all the forms, I think I found out, I got final confirmation exactly what my, what my pay situation was going to be the day before I went off on leave you know they just they just didn't have a policy in place they didn't have any paperwork at all so actually it was yeah a trial by fire um getting it all sorted out um and so um when I was on leave and it was also it was, it was four months I wasn't I wasn't backfilled um for either either time and um, so my job basically stopped and then came back and had to pick up four months worth of, of documentation work um and it was it was odd because I think culturally organizations get maternity leave they get they get mums going off looking after babies and coming back having had a baby and and, and we understand that and we're sympathetic towards that by and large 
I think people didn't really know how to cope with my return to work at all. It was kind of, well, you've been away for four months, um, get on with it. Well, I, actually, you know, yes, okay, dads don't give birth to kids. Of course they don't. And, and I'm not for a second belittling that at all. But we're knackered as well. You know, the sleep deprivation works for, for dads as well. You know, first return to work after my first child, absolutely exhausted. Um, you know, uh, every, everything that every speaker has spoken so far it applies to the dads as well. So and I don't think people quite got that. Um, and the second time I went off on leave was particularly challenging because I actually got this um, secondment to a, a managing a project um, post while I was on leave. And came back to basically have to set up a project and get it running. I think on my first day back, I was asked, well, when can you get a project plan ready? <laughs> I just spent four days, you know, four months, yeah, covered in vomit. I'm not really got the head screwed on right now to talk about project planning and Gantt charts and stuff. Give me, give me a bit of time. So that was, yeah, that was a challenge. But again, you know, like everyone else has been saying, lots of sympathetic colleagues, lots of understanding managers, um, which is, I think, the, the key thing, really. Thank you so much for sharing that and uh, really interesting to see um, the the kind of differences in how uh, different both mums and dads going off on parental slash maternity leave and, and, and how that's perceived differently by organizations and to the extent to which that might be um, gendered uh, to some extent. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite interesting. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I guess that kind of leads me on to a bigger question, um, which perhaps I'll put to you first, Ellie, um, just about how do you think, uh, to what extent do you think the museum sector is supportive uh, of new parents? And do you think that, that more should be done? Um, that's a really interesting question, actually. Because I've heard like various horror stories of my time off. Um, you hear, you know, word of people having to sign non-disclosure agreements. You hear of people having really difficult experiences. Um, you hear of people winning um, uh, court cases against the British Museum and things like that. And you know things aren't quite right. Um, but... Uh, I think there are, so I think there are some like really, you know, profound things that ought to be put right, which are establishing like the, the people's legal entitlements. You know, it's not a discretion benefit, a, a discretionary benefit like this is, this is the law and this is, this ought to be um, usual practice. And I'm not convinced that it, it is broadly um, done right. Um, but on a personal level, I found so many supportive people and supportive projects, and it's been great. Um, I don't know if that's perhaps to do with where I am in my career and um, the kinds of privilege that I hold. I don't know if that's evenly felt across the sector. Um, but yeah, you could definitely hear, hear, heard some you know terrible things about people being pushed out of their jobs and everything else. So it definitely happens, I think. Um, I don't think that job shares are particularly um you know that, that is not everyone wants to come back part-time not everyone is in that position um but job shares I've found really fantastic and it would be great to see that as a as more of an option so we're starting to see them in because they've suit different people in different stages of their careers and everything else um and also I suppose as over the last few years and this year especially things like working from home and flexible working and having museums which have core hours where they would expect you to be available and hours where you know that you're not I think is um, really positive and I do hope that that lasts I remember like early on in the pandemic saying to my mum like maybe we won't have to pretend anymore that we don't have other commitments and responsibilities like um because there was that first couple months where there was just like a cat or a kid in the background of everything every conversation you had they'd be like someone throwing something <laughs> and now it's settled down and we've all professionalized again and what have you but um I don't maybe maybe we'll be in a situation where it doesn't feel like we have to pretend anymore I don't know sorry they're only sort of half-baked thoughts but um I'll pass on that before I say anything really stupid no, I think that's a fantastic point um, about, you know, the way that COVID, although it's presented lots of difficulties, which some of the panelists have already mentioned, but also opportunities in, in terms of, um, you know, all of us getting a bit more of a glimpse and maybe a bit more empathy into other people's lives, which, you know, perhaps might benefit uh, at least some parents in the sector. Um, 
Rihanna, would you like to talk a little bit about if you think the sector is supportive enough for parents or if more should be done? My personal experience has been overwhelmingly positive. I work in an organisation where they could not have been more flexible and understanding. As I came back to give context, I came back from maternity leave having had an unwell baby and having been very unwell myself. And so work was a respite for me. Baby and I were fine after six months, but people were really understanding. I think what for me, something that could be worked on in the sector, and I think about maternity leave in general and parental leave is the language that we use because I found it difficult when I was going on maternity leave of having somebody say enjoy your time off and I hadn't had the baby and I knew that it wasn't time off. and for me it really wasn't time off or saying enjoy you know think of it like a long holiday I know I'm laughing at Ellie and Helen's face at this point and Nico's and don't you know if you can refer to the person covering someone on parental leave as their cover, not their replacement, because I haven't, I felt like I haven't gone anywhere. I am here, I'm just doing, doing these things and I'll be back doing those things in a bit. Um, but my, my experience of the Sonen and also Keats House where I um, work as a casual, they could not have been more understanding. And also Twitter is a very supportive museum parent community. In my personal experience, I've got to know Helen and Ellie um, Helen and I do Mental Health Monday, which I do with all of my mum friends that I know through baby classes and things where we just we check in and it's never just how are you, it's what's on your brain, what's bothering you, and it's a safe place to talk about it. And I think there are so many positive things about the museum sector. I know there's a lot of rubbish as well and things that are difficult. And I feel for me that becoming a parent has really unlocked this wonderful side of the museum sector. But I appreciate, like Kelly, I know all sorts of horror stories and that's not everyone's experience. And I just hope that people have the support that they need. That's really um, great and positive to hear that you had a positive experience. Um, Nico, would you like to talk a little bit about if you think the sector is supportive enough, perhaps to new dads and what mm. you think the sector should be doing to, to, to support them more? Um, sure. Well, um, I think I was looking at the participants list and, and actually uh, increasingly the case with, with a lot of museum conferences is actually very few blokes actually attending this. Um, I don't know if that's, I mean, I know there's a lot of talk about uh, you know, getting more more women working in museums, but actually, uh, outside management level, I'm getting the impression that actually we, we should be kind of trying to get more younger blokes working in museums. But that's a different issue altogether. Um, so yeah, I think um, as a sector, I, I can't speak for other organisations. I mean, I work very much for a, a council department, so it's all wrapped up within the larger council sort of corpus of, of policies and, and and procedures and what have you. Um, but I, I did find that that my immediate um, my immediate colleagues were much more supportive than perhaps the sort of council level. Uh, I mentioned earlier on when, when I was looking into taking shared parental leave, there was nothing in place at all, uh, and I had to basically fight and nag. And you know, it was email after email. Eventually, I found one name in the HR department who was very helpful. It turns out he was actually the guy that was writing the the plans and policies. So I badgered him and got the information I needed. So I think my, my advice would be for any, any blokes who are thinking of doing, you know, taking parental leave, it's 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 a right, it's a legal right. You know, anyone can take, you know, there's a few conditions. I think both partners need to be legible for, for shared parental leave, but basically it's not up to the employer to decide whether or not you can take leave. You know, it is your right and it's their problem if they if they want to, you know, find a cover if they want to you know deal with the, the financial payments and all that that's their problem you have a right to take that leave um so I, I, my, my issue was yeah very much more in getting getting it all in place um while I was on leave um and, and a bit before the, the language I think Ellie was was talking about the the language that's used um people would refer to me as going on maternity leave which is actually quite offensive because I mean I'm not a woman, I don't think. Um, I'm, I'm not maternal, I'm paternal, you know. Uh, it's a different kind of leave. It, 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 you know, other, other way, flip it around. If, if a woman had been told she was going on paternity leave, that's, no one would dream of saying that, I don't think. Um, but so the language was used was, was quite, quite offensive. So I'm not going on maternity leave. I've not had a baby, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, you know, it's, it's a very different kind of experience for, for men. Um, 
So eventually they got used to it and called it parental leave or, or shared parental leave. And I, I, I try and call it shared parental leave rather than just parental leave um, because that's what it is. It's, it's, it's a shared experience between both partners. That's, that's the point of it. Yeah, thank you so much, Nico. Really, really good points um, about language there um, and about employers um, just, you know, needing to make clear people's rights and also, you know, all of us as individuals being aware of our rights as well. Um, really important to mention that. I, I must say, I actually, I, I had a few sleepless nights thinking about what to call this session because I wanted to be <laughs> able to include everyone, but, you know, maternity leave, shared parental leave, adoption leave as well. Um, parental was kind of the biggest umbrella that I could get, but, it, you know, language is definitely very important, especially at such a sensitive time, uh, which is, you know, starting a family in one way or another. Um, Helen, did you have anything to add on how you think the sector as a whole could be more supportive to parents, new parents? Um, yeah, I think as Nico's already um, uh, suggested, we are a sector, we all know, that is really quite heavily dominated by, by women. Um, and I think possibly because of that, um, as a sector, I think, I, I think ev everyone is quite supportive. Um, if women didn't feel supported in taking maternity leave and using the rights they have around that within the museum sector I, I think you know ev everything will go to pot because I, th I think there are so many of us um in terms of what more can be done um I was actually really really lucky with uh the situation around my maternity leave and my maternity pay in particular um because I was actually pregnant when I started my current role um, which is quite unusual. Most maternity policies have a clause written into them that basically means if you're pregnant when you start a new job, you're going to lose a lot of your rights um, in terms of maternity pay. Um, and I had to kind of wheedle out of my employer um, at the point where we were negotiating um, me, me taking this, this new job the fact that on the 1st of January 2020, um, the Uni University of Oxford introduced a new policy which removed the qualification of needing to have worked for them for nine months before you qualified for maternity pay. And that meant that I was able to, to take this job. It meant I was able to make the move. And thinking about that, I think it's a really positive step forward because that would have been a barrier um, to my career progression, um, potentially for quite a long time, where I'm sat there thinking, well, maybe I want to move on into a new job, but I'm trying to have a baby. So seeing as how I wouldn't know I was pregnant until four or five weeks into that pregnancy, you know, I'm, I, I'm being prevented from even thinking about making a move. And that kind of barrier isn't there for, for the dads. Um, no one would say, well, you know, your wife's having a, having a baby in three months time, you can't move jobs. Um, so, I mean, that, that's been a massive positive for me. And it's something that I, I, I really want to advocate, you know, far and wide is, is to get rid of that, um, that requirement to have worked somewhere for X amount of time before you qualify. Um, I think that would be a really positive step forward in the sector. That's a really excellent point, Helen. Thank you for sharing that and uh, a worthy cause for sure that I think many of us could agree with. Um, and I think also the point you touched on about men, which kind of goes back to Nico's point as well, is that, you know, if me more men are kind of, you know, if it was seen as more normative for men to take shared parental leave, then perhaps there wouldn't be this discrimination against pregnant women um, if if both partners, if it's expected that they would be taking leave. Mm -hmm. um, it actually leads on to a question that's been submitted anonymously um, from the audience. Um, and maybe Helen, you could just briefly speak to this from your experience. Um, but uh, someone is uh, has recently been made redundant and is job searching um, whilst they're pregnant. Um, what advice would you give to them in terms of what to look out for for organizations or you know wherever they're looking for work? Um, I think the best advice I could give would be do go searching and ask if you need to, to see the maternity policy in advance, um, whether, whether that's at the point you're making your application or if you want to do, to do that before an interview or whatever. Um, do, do make the best efforts you can to actually see the policy and understand what that would mean for you. Um, I'm fairly certain that that kind of information from within an institution should be in the public domain. 
Um, I don't think they can withhold it just from someone who's not not yet an employee. Um, and I mean, I, I thought about this, you know, before, whilst I was job hunting myself, if it means you have to set up another email address and slightly anonymously ask to see the maternity policy, then do it. Um, you know, if, if you feel that that is, is a, a safer option, perhaps. That's a really great suggestion. Thank you, Helena. We, here at Fair Museum Jobs, we love a little bit of incognito research. <laughs> um, would anyone else from the panel like to speak to um, any thoughts they would have about job hunting uh, while pregnant or while thinking about starting a family? Um, just a, a, a little thing, actually, while while I was on leave um, with my second child, uh, my wife actually did get a new job. Um, so she was technically still, it was, it was her last month of maternity leave and she got offered a job when she applied. Um, I mean, I don't think she quite took the baby with her to the interview. I think I probably took the day off. Um, but she was very open about that. And it turns out that she's working for a, um, an organization that's very switched on to all these things. So they were very sympathetic. And in the end, her previous employer actually gave her a month off, a paid month off. Is it garden leave, they, they call it? Um, but I think to a certain extent, um, yeah, just just be be open about it. And, and, and I mean, if it's if it's against an organization policy, then that's that's rubbish. And it's great to hear that Oxford, you know, change this the, uh, the the point at which people are entitled to pay um but i do think that you know there's no point in trying to be too sneaky by all means be sneaky when you're finding out but don't try and be sneaky during the recruitment because you know it'll catch up on you and you can't really hide a baby um so um i just be, be careful <laughs> Thank you, Nico. Um, the next question I was going to ask uh, I, has actually been asked by someone much better in the chat. So I'm going to put it to the panel. And I see, um, I see, uh, Rhiannon actually has already uh, responded. Um, but so someone asks who is currently um, taking maternity leave uh, is wondering about if anyone here on the panel has felt pressure to kind of keep up professionally speaking, um, such as attending conferences, keeping up to date with what's happening in the sector, kind of maintain your professional profile, even when you're meant to be on leave. Um, Rhiannon, did you, did you have any thoughts about that? So further to what I've said in the chat is I realized that the pressure was coming from me that I wanted to be, I was trying to be all things to all people at the start, particularly when I'd recovered from being unwell, baby was, and he had severe reflux, but was recovering. And I thought, oh my goodness, I'm vaguely keeping abreast in the middle of the night, I'm not sure what day it is, don't really know who I am or where I am or what we're doing, but oh my goodness, there's been a conference about, I think it was something on museums education this sort of time last year. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm gonna go back to work. I'm gonna get made redundant no one's ever going to employ me. And I thought, where is this coming from? And I think it was because I felt so out of control of every aspect of my life with mounting, washing, screaming baby, tired, mostly tiredness, that I felt like I needed to be doing everything. But for me, I, what I've tried to focus on even now is when I participate in something or do a, tra a training afternoon or a workshop, I'm trying to do little things well. And so rather than trying to do everything, because in the sector, you can't attend everything. There's such a wealth of amazing places to get information and things online and everything's on YouTube, et cetera. I think do, keeping your hand in is great for your own sanity would be my take on it, but just try to do what you can. But nobody, there's not a test when you go back on your sector knowledge. People have, really, I found personally that people have been really kind and understanding. And also I feel like even before I had kids, I didn't go to everything and know everything. So it doesn't have to change just because you're a parent. Thank you so much, Rhiannon. and really good to have some perspective there. Um, Ellie, did you want to add anything on um, the pressure to kind of stay in touch with the sector, uh, even when you're meant to be on leave? Yeah, totally. And I would kind of echo what Rhiannon was saying. I found it very, very difficult after so many years trying to um, get my career going to do something that out of um you know that that wasn't career focused and i i mean it's ridiculous because i was actually a really um bit of a slacker so <laughs> i 
And suddenly I, I kind of lost that whole side of my identity. I couldn't sleep. I nearly died. I was, um, I was so jealous of my partner going back to work and putting on normal clothes and leaving the house and reading a book and playing on his phone. I was livid every morning. And it was really, really difficult to just um, be shit at something. And everyone's going, oh, you're, such a, you're doing so well. You're doing so well. You're like, I'm covered in, in sick. All the baby's clothes are covered in poo. Everything in this house smells. There's every type of bodily fluid everywhere. I'm not doing a good job. I'm three, four weeks into this and I'm, I'm still crap. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I was 10 years into what I was just doing just now. <laughs> I was better at that. And it's really hard. And um, my dad retired at the same, around the same sort of time. And he was like, well, you're going to go back. <laughs> He said, I'm not, that's over for me, but you'll go back one day. And um, being on furlough kind of reminded me of it because you're suddenly like stripped of all your, um, you know, I like feeling busy and important and vaguely professional and competent and clean. Um, and um, yeah, you know, it, it's difficult when you're doing, um, caring for uh, kids full time or even just one. Um, and you just don't feel like you're hitting your stride <laughs> so it was really hard and I remember I'd absolutely no idea what having a baby would be like and I just ignored everyone who said what told me what it would be like because I was just like well I've got a couple of papers to write I mean I'll probably do a mentoring program I expect I'll organize a conference and then I remember sitting there and this midwife just being like yeah I thought I was going to write a paper and I was like, okay, this is like the only thing, like helpful thing a midwife or health visitor has said that actually rings true. <laughs> like maybe all babies are different and all families and support structures are different. And the situation I was in was just one where there wasn't going to be time to, um, and or maybe I wasn't going to be writing a paper that year. And you know what? Um, it didn't really matter because then I got back to work and then I, was like raring to go and sort stuff out and super impatient and so I didn't know it at the time but like my time would come sorry I'm just blabbering on for ages um but that was that was what I'd say is that it's, it is really hard and um I really really missed it and I think at this point in time it's probably even more acute because everyone's like aware of all the, the sector-wide stuff as well um and actually when I was younger I didn't I didn't see many women get promoted after having families. Um, and I was really aware that I would like more money and power one day. And um, so I put a lot of pressure on myself. But it turns out that leave is only a fixed amount of time and you can vaguely manage. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if that's reassuring. That's great, Ellie. Thank you. Um, really good to get that really real take from you. Um, and actually, it leads on very well to my next question for the panel, which is, um, you know, to what extent has becoming a parent maybe changed your perspective or your approach to your work? Has it maybe made you better at your job in some ways? Um, Nico, would you uh, like to speak to that first? Um, it puts life in perspective, really. Um, I don't, I've, I've, I've given up worrying too much about work, I have to say. Um, I, I finish at, at, well, actually today I'll finish a little bit later, but normally I finish at five and, and that's it. Um, I think you, you, you've got to, I think, um, there, there's so much more important things in life than, than work. Um, I think when you've got small people running around the house, um, how, whatever age they are, um, it, you, you know, you can try during the whole lockdown business. I was trying to do, you know, look, my wife and I were splitting time between looking after the kids who are at home and, and trying to work. And I just found that actually very difficult with the, the sort of the change in mindset, you know, sort of sitting in front of the computer in this room doing work and then going out of that door. And then suddenly it's, you know, it's making dents and playing a bill. Um, we, you know and it is that that's that switch in in mindset which i found very very difficult um but it, it does it puts in perspective i think yeah okay job jobs are important and you, you want you want to get on with your career and obviously everybody wants a bit more money that'd be lovely um but i think it's um it's put into perspective that said i i have experienced um i don't know if it's if it's just the, the personalities myself included uh, or if it's the 
the effect of it being uh, a dad on 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 parental leave but um the way the way you're treated and the expectations um that I've experienced been very different to what I I've seen my female colleagues have been expected um I think it was all such a new thing it was again it was only four months as well which in the grand scheme of things isn't isn't huge um but there was this kind of feeling that I would just um come back to work and 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 people were giving me more more space and more time I think than perhaps my female colleagues um which is odd I, I can't I can't put a finger on that people were much more sympathetic um there was one meeting when I was on leave uh, I really had to come to this meeting and um my wife couldn't take the day off work so I took the baby into the meeting um and thankfully he slept through it all so it was fine um and I remember one female colleague of mine saying that she part of her was really pleased that I could do this that I felt happy and comfortable enough that I could do this and didn't have any sort of problems with it at all but part of her also felt actually quite um angry is probably too strong a word but she felt quite strongly that hang on she would never even consider doing that you know the the whole the whole idea about a mum on maternity leave you're you're basically out of the picture you're not at work you don't bring your babies to, to work whereas because there's no there's no culture that's evolved around men on parental leave yet so there's there's no rule book um and and i think that's an opportunity to actually maybe kind of you know make that rule book equal for both and if, if you know if a mum needs to come to a meeting and bring her baby in then she should be allowed to and not not feel that you know she's she's the mum she's actually a professional woman who's in a meeting who's brought her kid along um that's how people saw me why why can't people see mums like that so i don't know there's a lots of issues there <laughs> Uh, I think that's a really good point. And I think your example really crystallized, um, you know, the, the different standards and expectations that are mm. often set for men and women uh, in the workplace, especially after they become parents uh, and what's seen as professional and what's not and what's a, an example of a good mom and a good dad uh, and the way that we can yet yeah, use the opportunity, perhaps even of lockdown and seeing into people's lives a little bit more as maybe a way to unpack and explode and make those ideas a little bit more equal. Um, uh, next, I think I'll go to Helen. Did you want to talk a little bit about has, uh, I know you haven't been back at work for that long, but um, has, do you think becoming a parent has uh, had a positive impact on the way that you work in any way? I think it's in, in the long term, probably going to improve my ability to switch off at the end of the day and that kind of work life balance thing. Um, Certainly in the past, I've I'm, I've been someone who's got quite emotional about my work. I get quite emotionally invested in making sure that all the loans I'm sending out and receiving back is all going smoothly and I want it to work really, really well for everyone else. Um, but when, you know, now, now I've got a baby, my mind is permanently slightly somewhere else. Um, you know, you, you've always got that that little section um, that's that's wondering, you know, how, how baby's getting on. Um, so yeah, I, th I, th I think going forward, I can see myself being much more kind of work to live type balance rather than live to work. Um, the caveat to all of that is work isn't normal right now. Um, obviously I'm not in the office, there's nothing traveling in a exhibitions loans kind of way. Um, so as that ramps up, you know, maybe that balance is, is going to change again. But certain, certainly for the moment, um, it feels much more, you know, my work is what I do to earn money so that we can, you know, yeah. keep this baby alive. <laughs> Very important. And uh, yeah, good to hear there's a little bit of a theme going on here about the, the work uh, life balance and the being able to switch off. Um, Ellie, would you like to speak to um, the uh, impact that, um, that that becoming a parent has had on your work? Um, I guess maybe in some ways I'm a bit, uh, maybe, maybe it's different, um, but because I really, it just made me realize how much it meant to me. Um, and uh, I suppose like I suppose it may be a bit unhealthy to, to what degree um, my self-esteem was bound up in it which is a bit odd really considering I'd never done that much that was very good but anyway um, it's made me super impatient um, of now just like 
well, we know what we need to do. Let's just do it. Can we get that sorted? Can we do that? Whereas before I was a bit like, oh, well, I think I'll read my emails a bit. Let's just read the email again. Whereas I'm like, I'm just sending it, just sending it. They can deal with it. We're all grown ups. Um, so I'm definitely more impatient. I think I'm more ambitious. Um, and I'm just probably, I used to be really shy, I think. And I used to be quite self critical. Now I just, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> I've uh, yeah, I've lost quite a lot of that uh, sense of shame um, or self doubt. If everyone's got, if it, you know, there's a problem, then I'm sure someone will tell me and we can sort it out. Um, I'm probably a bit more confident in my abilities. I think I've learned to ask for help a bit more. I might not have. I might just still be fucking stuff up all the time. But I still, I swear a lot at work now. <laughs> I can't swear as much at home. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I don't piss about as much as I used to. And I think I'm a better listener. But everyone now around me might think that's all total rubbish. Um, but yeah, I was kind of thinking, oh, you know, become a mother, become a mother and have some uh, transformation and some big like um, awakening. But I think I'm just like a, a bit rattier and... <laughs> I'm more impatient um so yeah so in those ways I'd say maybe it's changed me I'll probably just I'll probably just go back to normal soon <laughs> it does sound somewhere like that, like you get two years after with it like whatever major life change you go through like two years later you'll probably be roughly the same I don't know if that's true but yeah there wasn't some massive professional development that happened but it does sound like you've definitely uh, taken some new approaches into the workplace, which which sound which sound a lot of them sound quite positive. Um, Rhiannon, I know that you talked a little bit about um, have you know the difficulties of now kind of having to compress your work into this very hard deadline. Um, but is there any other kind of differences to your approach to work or uh, the way that you work um, that are that that have changed since becoming a parent? Definitely and. Further to what Ellie has said, I have always professionally been quite assertive and blunt. And I would say having less time and being very tired. Uh, my boss coined the phrase, you're a little bit Miriam Margulies, which I think is the highest compliment that anyone could ever pay. And I do work really, really hard to rein it in at work sometimes, particularly if we have a meeting about a meeting on a day when I'm already slammed and I know I've got to leave at 4.30, non-negotiable. What I've learned to do particularly once when I came back in February, is if you have a meeting that's a bit pointless and you don't need to be indoors, suggest you go for a walk because you either get some fresh air or the person decides that pouring rain in February, maybe it isn't so important to have that pointless meeting after all. I've definitely learned, I've gained a sense of perspective and when I was pregnant because I had hyperemesis, so extreme pregnancy vomiting. And I had previously worked and worked and worked. And I realized that when I was so unwell, I wasn't looking after myself. Everyone around me was looking after me at work and at home. And I was just, well, I'm pregnant, but it was a bit like Ellie. I'm going to be a mother. I'm super zen. I can get through this. Well, actually, Rhiannon, you're projectile vomiting acid. You really shouldn't be going into work. Like, come on. And it's really helped me to think about myself more. And to be a bit more selfish, I feel like I had put everything into my career. I came in in what I thought was fairly late. I've been, I've worked in publishing and been a teacher before. I've been in this job three years now. And I was paranoid that, you know, I don't want having a baby to be the end of my museum career, which it never was going to be. If anything, I think I'm better at my job now. I'm more organized because I have to be. I think my empathy levels are definitely for me have increased. You know, this might also, like Ellie said, all be absolute bullshit, but I'm also very sweary, sorry. But I've definitely got firmer boundaries with home and work because you have no choice, particularly when my husband was commuting. He's not at the moment um, and I'm commuting two or three days a week. It was basically a case of passing the baby. And once you have that baby, he doesn't care if you've got a work call. If he wants to play in his ball pit, that is what we are doing. And nothing's. And I think having that, for, that hard deadline has been really good for me. Um, something I'd recommend reading for anyone who's interested, the Mary Portas book, Work Like a Woman, was fantastic for me. I read it when I was pregnant. I was trying to use my commute whilst I still had the time. And I'm grateful that I had that now, even though the central line is diabolical. And it talks about 
not working, like you don't have a kid at home. That's something I've learned. Also, um, Anna Whitehouse talks about, um, she, Mother Pucker on Instagram, she runs the Flex Appeal, is talking about leaving loudly. So I make a point, my first day back, I was desperate to make a good impression, having been off. And I had to leave at 5.30, I had to go. And at 5.28, a colleague came in and I could not shut them up. And I didn't feel that I could say, I've got to leave, the childminder is leaving at 6.30. And I ended up leaving 15 minutes late. Childminder was absolutely gracious about it and it was all fine. But I've now learned to say, if someone comes in at 5.28, I always say, rushing out, I'll see you tomorrow. Why don't you ring me? And I'll talk to you as I walk to the tube, if it's urgent. Nothing, very few things at work are so important that they can't wait. And I've definitely learned that the hard way. But um, swearing definitely helps. I'd recommend it. Thank you so much, Rhiannon. And um, all of you are much better parents than me because the reason I don't swear at work is because I swear in front of my child instead. Um, I, we're running out of time. We've only got six minutes left. Um, so I just thought I'd go through the panel one more time with one final question, um, which I'm sure uh, our audience is keen to know. Um, what is the one thing that you wish you knew before you took your maternity or shared parental leave um, that you'd perhaps like to share with others. Um, perhaps, uh, Helen, would you like to share one thing you wish you knew? This is the one question that you, you gave us in advance I didn't have a note on. <laughs> um, looking back on everything that's been said in, in the past hour or so, um, the one thing I wish I'd known, wish I'd realised is the world is not going to stop because you're not doing your role for six, nine, 12 months, whatever. Um, in, in the nicest possible way, everyone is dispensable for in, in that time. Um, the reason you've got this leave is the most incredible reason in the world. You know, you've got this, this, this new life coming, coming into your life. Um, and be kind to yourself, use, use the leave for what it's meant for. Um, focus on that. And I think that, that time will then make you all the better equipped to go back to work after your your allotted time and and find that new balance and, and be the best you can be at both. Thank you so much, Helen. Really wise words. Um, the fact that you know it is a short period of time in the scheme of things, and um, it, it's 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 a it's a very unique opportunity that you can't necessarily get back. So so take advantage of it while you can. Um, I think that's maybe yeah. putting putting a, <laughs> saying your words in a different way, but thank you. Um, Nico, would, would you like to share maybe one thing that you wish that you knew uh, before going on shared parental leave? Um, I can't honestly think of it, uh, really. Um, I, I it was it was the whole thing was such a, a huge I mean I know for everybody everybody having a kid is a, a huge unknown of course it is but um the the sort of logistics of being a dad going off on leave when your kids I think uh was eight months no six months old um nine months old the, the, the both kids were um I, I didn't know I kind of thought that I could because at that, that stage particularly with the uh, my daughter the the, the oldest kid um my wife had a, a group of friends from the antenatal classes, which I'm sure you've, you've all kind of tapped into and you've all got that support network. So um, I kind of foolishly thought I could, when she went back to work, I could just go along in, in her place. And no, that, that, that didn't work. <laughs> um, so I think probably I, I, I'd have liked to have known, and for the second time I was prepared for it, first time round, I wasn't prepared for how lonely it was gonna be. Uh, a dad on parental leave, it's a lonely world um you know it's just me and and a very small baby uh all day going around the park um people making ridiculously stupid comments uh yes i'm a dad with a child it's not that crazy every every child on earth has a father somewhere uh you know <laughs> um and it was yeah it was quite it was quite lonely um the first time round, and i kind of perhaps would have yeah it prepared me for the the, the second when the second child was around um I kind of thought, okay, fine. It's just going to be four months, just me, me and him, just doing our thing, and and that's fine. We're not gonna, we're not gonna try and get into any any networks. The, the the dad networks are quite militant, which is not my cup of tea. I don't I don't want you know. It tends to be kind of, you know, the dads who it's more kind of 
complicated situation where there's custody battles and all that kind of stuff, which <laughs> is thankfully not the case. You know, um, there's not just a group of dads who just want to hang out and, and, and play with their kids. You know, it, it tends to be a little bit more politicized. Uh, perhaps it needs it because, um, you know, shared parental leave hasn't been picked up on that much. There's only 7% of couples that take parent, uh, shared parental leave. So, you know, it does need to be, people need to be more aware that it, it's an option that people can can do. Um, but I wasn't ready to start fighting too many battles. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, and I, I feel, Nico, what you're saying is, is that there's a place maybe for museums, maybe some people who are listening to this conversation to start making some opportunities for dads with kids to, to meet up and in, in, a, in just in a fun, enjoyable social way, um, the way that, that many mums get to have. Um, so I'm probably just reading into what you're saying, but that's the inspiration I took from that. So thank you. Um, Rhiannon, would you like to go next, share one thing that you really wish you had known before uh, taking leave? I think the one thing I would tell myself at the beginning, so just after my son was born last August, would be that you can't fill from an empty cup. And we wear so many hats. I felt like I was a mum, a wife, a daughter, a sister. I'm, you know, a museum learning person. I do casual front of house. I'm doing a master's. And I think something that I wish I could tell myself is you've got to look after yourself. And I know it's really hard when you've got this tiny person totally reliant on you. If like me, my husband wasn't able to take shared parental leave, he works in a very different sector where it's just not, it's not a thing. I know that it's a legal right, but it's not a thing. And I felt like I was running on empty for a really long time. And I know I had lots of additional circumstances, but I would say if there is anything you can do, whether it's have a bath, have a hot cup of tea by yourself, that is how I start every day. Anything that you can do that keeps you sane is okay and just do it because everyone that relies on you needs you to feel good if you can. And if you don't feel good, you know, reach out, whether it's on Twitter, drop me a message. I'm always happy to chat as Ellie and Helen can vouch for. Drop someone a message, seek support. You know, you're not on your own in this journey. There are so many museum parents. There are people, I have colleagues I didn't know had children because they don't talk about them but everyone is here for you and rooting for you. And I wish I could go back and tell myself that to start. Thank you so much, Rhiannon. It's really wise advice there that um, you need to look after yourself in order to look after others. Uh, we're all, we're, we're basically at time, but just very briefly, Ellie, did you want to just share something you wish you knew before going on leave? Yeah, okay, I'll just keep it short. Um, but I would say to myself, you are going to love it. Um, your confidence will grow. The union will sort it out you'll write that paper one day it won't and um you will really come to enjoy what you've done to your life <laughs> you will really love it one day don't worry Thank you, Ali. That's very reassuring. Um, well, we've come to time now. Uh, that's the end of um, our panel for today about parental leave. Uh, thank you so much to all of our panelists uh, for sharing their experiences and taking part. And thank you to all of you in the audience for uh, your great questions and the really supportive chat that's been going on too. Uh, we have recorded this session, so we will make it available um, later on, as well as the resources shared in the chat. Um, so once again, thank Thanks everyone for taking part and we hope to see you at some other sessions at the summit.